Well, I'm excited to jump into part four of Spirit-Filled Thinking. And um, prayerfully, this has been a, um, a helpful series for you guys. Originally, we were just gonna take a few weeks to talk about Spirit-Filled Thinking, but it's, it's just grown. Honestly, as we've given more of our attention um, to, to what does it look like to not only be spirit filled, but also to have a renewed mind so we could steward the filling of the spirit in our life. Amen. In fact, Paul, when he talked about being filled with the spirit, it was never just about a, a baptism that happened at one time. It was always the evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that was being produced through people, through the words they spoke, through, uh, through what they gave their attention to, through the life they lived. And so when we talk talk about spirit-filled thinking, it's not just about thoughts that you have, because I mean, you know, thoughts become words and words create worlds. Amen. And so one of the things that we are invited is to begin to start thinking like God. Amen. And in Isaiah 55, of course, in verse eight, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. But aren't you glad that's not the end of the chapter? He goes on to say, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts from your thoughts and my ways from your ways. But Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will, your will, your mind, your will, your emotions be on earth as it is in heaven. And so when Jesus told us to pray like that, and when Jesus came to the earth, lived a perfect life, died a horrible death, sent the Holy Spirit to where we could live just like him and takes up his home in our heart, we no longer have to live apart from God's thoughts. We no longer have to live not knowing his ways, trying to figure things out on our own, but we're able to seek the Holy Spirit. We're able to have the mind of the Spirit, like Paul said in Romans chapter eight. And, 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 and God through Isaiah says that we actually begin to think like God and we begin to walk in the ways of the Lord. I mean, we, there's actually a revival of the ways of God that is coming to this country. There's a revival. Of, Psalm 119.37, I love what Meredith shared about the turning. It says, turn my eyes away from worthless things, that you would revive me in your ways and establish your word to your servant who fears your name. And listen, I want the establishing of his word, but even more than that, I want his ways. I just don't, I don't want just the what connected to the word. I want the how connected to the way. Amen? And, 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 and God through Isaiah says that as these thoughts and these ways begin to find a heart, he says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven. Why the rain and the snow? Well, both are contained in the treasuries. Deuteronomy 28 says, I'll open my good treasure of the heavens and calls it a rain on your land in its season. In Job chapter 37 and 38, it talks about a treasury of snow and a treasury of hail. So he says, when, uh, when, when the rain and the snow come down from heaven and water the earth, what were we formed out of? What was Adam formed out of? The dust of the earth. It says that it would bring forth to bud. That word bud literally means to bubble forth or to prophesy. And so what it is, is when the thoughts and the ways begin to find a home in us, we begin to give God's word and his, wi and his, and his will our voice. Verse 11 is, a, is, and it's interesting, a lot of times people wanna quote verse eight and verse 11. His thoughts are not our thoughts, but so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Verse 11 says, so shall my, my, my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will accomplish what I sent it to do and it'll prosper in that place. But I wanna tell you today that you are the mouthpiece for God's word. That when your heart and your mind come into alignment with God's thoughts and his ways, and you give God's word your voice, then his word is able to bring to pass what he has promised and to accomplish what he desires to do. It goes on in verse 12 and 13 to say that, that all of a sudden the mountains, mountains will begin to move and the trees will begin to clap their hands as we go forth with peace and we're led out with joy. And what you see in Isaiah 55 is when we begin to think like God, we begin to speak like God, we begin to have the emotions like God, the feelings of God as well. Because emotions and feelings are not a bad thing. They're actually a gift from God. And one of the things that I've shared even in this series is, is I kind of avoided emotions for a long time. Anybody with me? Because people who were emotional in my mind and part of what I was taught coming up and even people I was told to avoid, well, they're, you know, unstable, undependable, irrational, you know. And, and, and you know, they're, they're the ones that could create issue if you let them get too close. So, so one of the things is you start to find yourself judging people who have an emotion and maybe it's an unprocessed emotion, maybe it's a yet to be redeemed understanding of a feeling that they genuinely have, but it's being filtered through a fear they're not called to, uh, to co-labor with. 
And so I found myself judging people because of their emotions and their feelings, saying, well, can't they just believe the word? And how many of you know we need to believe the word? But at the same time, thoughts are the language of the mind. Emotions are the language of the soul, okay? Mind and soul are different. You're gonna see this in Mark chapter 12, but feelings are the language of the body. And what we see is when we begin to think like God, we begin to experience God-like emotions, like joy, peace, love, gentleness, meekness, self-control. We begin to experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us when we begin to think the thoughts of the Spirit. And then we begin to experience that as well. Because God has made us, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, to be sanctified completely, what? Body, soul, and spirit. And understanding each language and not demonizing any one of the languages helps us to be the more full expression of who we're called to be. Has anybody ever felt like you had to be a diet version of yourself? Less filling. (laughs) Did anybody ever feel like you had to kind of pull it back a bit, right? Listen, you're not called to, I I love what Michael said. We're not called to play it safe. We're not called to hold back. We're called to be the full expression of who we are but it has to be the full expression of the new man and not the old man, amen? See, sometimes we have no problems expressing the old man. But for some reason, people have, have a difficulty feeling the freedom to express the fullness of the new creation. And Paul in Ephesians chapter four says that when we put off the old man and the former conduct, we then are transformed, we're renewed in the spirit of our mind, which then allows us to put on the new man. And, and, and here's the thing is, we are all given the invitation of being made brand new in Christ Jesus. How many of you know Paul said, if anybody be in Christ, they are a new creation, amen? But it's not just about receiving the invitation, it's also about beginning to act on that invitation. Not just in the promise and the principle, but also in the practice. And that's where our thoughts play such a big part. And really when we talk about Spirit-filled thinking, spirit-filled thinking is simply sustained stewardship of first love. If I was to dial all this, everything we're talking about with spirit-filled thinking back, it would, be, it would be a sustained stewardship of first love. In other words, I'm keeping Jesus first in what I think. The thoughts I think, the words I speak, and therefore the emotions I have and the feelings they produce. Because feelings that are not the fruit of truth will deceive you, amen? And where people get into trouble is when they live their life based on what feels good. Or they have an emotion that all of a sudden when it's not anchored in truth and it's not properly processed, it creates unmet expectation because it's an unexpressed communication. Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody and you've got all of this pent up anxiety, you've got all this pent up uh, feelings or possibly frustration and they have no idea? Come on, I see all you wives looking at your husband. (laughs) They just think everything is great and you're over here just going, could I just, you know? There's something about being able to, to, to safely and transparently process what's happening on the inside so that, we can, so that we can recognize that oftentimes what is happening to us does not have to happen in us. Amen? Did you know sin against you doesn't have to reduce sin in you? And one of the ways to, to keep sin from being produced in you when sin is done to you is to have a healthy way of processing what happens in your life to be able to give it to God and only hold on to what he wants you to have. But again, spirit-filled thinking is the sustained stewardship of first love. Jesus in Mark chapter 12, they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Of course, he began to quote Deuteronomy chapter six, but he added an extra component, which is kind of where we've been and what we've been talking about kind of as the inspiration for this series. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31 says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And one of the things that I've recognized just in living life and watching how other people live it is oftentimes the issues that separate us 
don't have as much to do with the other person. They have more to do with the issues that we've judged others and therefore judge ourselves. And so when Jesus says that the second commandment is to love others as we love ourselves, the truth is it's hard to love others when you don't like you. And I want to give you permission today to like you. In fact, you're created in God's image, so you have permission to love you. Now, at the same time, real love doesn't seek its own. So to love you doesn't mean you seek you. It means you honor and you appreciate the image of God that you're created in. And one of the ways that we do that is by thinking what God thinks about us, about ourselves and about others. Because they say about, that, that people tend to uh, think about 75,000 thoughts a day. That's a whole lot of things going on in your mind. That's a lot of hamsters on the wheel. And, if, and, and, and how many of you know, Paul said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For, taking ca- for, for pulling down strongholds, what? Taking every thought captive. Now, if you got 75,000 thoughts running wild, that's a, that's, listen, that's a whole lot of thoughts to take captive. But you're not supposed to be thinking a bunch of thoughts that need to be taken captive, and that's where being renewed in the spirit of our mind takes over. Because then you find yourself thinking less thoughts that need to be taken captive. But when you have a thought come to you that doesn't line up with what God thinks about you, you quickly take it captive and you replace it with the truth that God thinks about you. And it's really important that we begin to think the way that God thinks so we can speak the way that God speaks and we can steward our heart, his house, our homes, our head, our hand, according to his heart. Because when we miss steward our hearts, or we missteward our voice as a Christian, we misrepresent Christ. And there's definitely been a misrepresentation of Christ in the past. Amen? Even Gandhi said, it's not your Christ that I have a problem with, it's your Christians. Because there's a lot of people that have, been, that have prayed a prayer to be delivered from a situation, but who really wants to be born from above? Who really wants to be transformed in the renewing of their mind. Because real change oftentimes involves pain. And people, typ- people typically don't change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Has anybody ever gotten to a place in your life where you're like, I don't care what it costs me, we better change some stuff. It can be relational, it can be physical, it can be financial. Maybe you got on the scales and you couldn't see, you're having to get somebody else to check the weight to see what it was. All of a sudden, you're having to get help putting on your socks and shoes. I mean, you, everybody has been to a place where you said this far and no more, amen. And what we have to do is we recognize that there is a place in our life that we come, we recognize things have got to change so I can be more like Christ. And I think as a nation, we're at that place. I think as a church, we're at that place. Not Kingsway Church, I'm talking the church. Because there's been things that have been allowed in moderation that have led to excess, Amen? And so coming back to the root and the foundation of what God thinks about us is of paramount importance. In fact, the most important thing you could think is God thoughts towards you. The most important sermon you're gonna hear today is not from me, it's the sermon in your mind that you're speaking all day long. So again, Jesus said this was the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind with all your strength. And only then can we really love others. The root of racism is self-hatred. Can't love your neighbor as you love yourself if you don't like you. All discrimination and all prejudice is actually the fruit of judging others and then judging yourself. Amen? And this is honestly, this is even the podcast coming out this week. This is where where all of a sudden you don't measure, you know, you know, you don't, you don't measure the quality of your life by whether or not you're successful, but whether or not you're fulfilled. In other words, not, not what I'm able to attain or to produce, but what I'm able to reproduce by the Spirit. Amen? And God wants us to have success, but good success. And a lot of what looks like success in the eyes of the world is not good success. It's bad success. It's success that can cost you, your, cost you your, your marriage, it can cost you your family, it can cost you your integrity, it can cost you your character if you put attaining, a pose- attaining to a position or grabbing a hold of a possession higher than your purpose. 
And I think some of this has gotten into the church as well. And in, that, in those places, we have found ourselves conformed to the world or shaped by our situation. And God is inviting us to be transformed. How many of you are ready to be transformed? I know I am. Spirit-filled thinking is simply allowing the Lord's love for us, our love for the Lord, and then our combined co-labored love for others to be the motivation for the thoughts that we think, the words that we speak, and the, love, and the life that we then live. And I wanna tell you this, love... To think like love, because God is love, right? And love is one of those terms right now that is being misapplied and and misused, right? But I want to tell you, love is always thinking about truth. Love is always thinking about truth. And Paul encourages us to what? Speak truth and love. I remember early on when we came to Birmingham, I was asked by somebody, who had started coming to the church and he came up and you know, he, was, you know, he was obviously very happy with what was going on and what he was experiencing and the move of the Holy Spirit. And, and, um, and he said, listen, before I really become a part of what you're doing here, I need to know if you're a grace man. And how many of you know that sometimes somebody can, can, can ask something that sounds right, but it feels wrong? It's like that check we were talking about. I said, I'm not a grace man. <laughs> Kind of surprised him, right? Because I'm a new covenant preacher. I said, I'm a Jesus man. He goes, what? I said, yeah, my Bible says Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. And the truth is you're not asking for grace. You have present sin in your life that you don't want to lay down. Do you want to know if I'm good with that? And grace doesn't give you a pass to be less. Grace is the divine enablement to become more. Amen? And what is happening in our world right now is under the umbrella of grace and love, we have lessened a standard that misrepresents Jesus Christ. And Jesus is worthy of the highest standard. And if we really love people, we should love them enough to put their future ahead of our present. That means I may tell you something that you don't like right now and you may not talk to me tomorrow, but it could save you a month from now. And too often we're afraid of what, 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 what could happen in our present if we really spoke truth and love. But I'll tell you this, speaking the truth and love gives the Holy Spirit something to work with in their heart. Not speaking the truth out of fear gives the enemy a place to continue to steal, kill, and destroy in their life. And truth tends to sound a lot like hate to those who hate the truth. I heard it said recently. (laughs) Truth, and this is why a lot of people have backed away from truth, is because sometimes truth can be called hate speech. I got got in trouble with Facebook for quoting Abraham Lincoln. And so just the other day, I got like another warning. And they're like, like, this is it. Last straw. I'm like, it's a direct quote from a speech. But the truth is it doesn't fit with the narrative of where we are today. But I want to tell you, truth will transform people. Truth will transform people. But but again, to, to those who are deceived or already believing a lie, truth can sound like hate because they hate the truth. Because to acknowledge the truth means you acknowledge your need of a savior and that you have to change. Truth is a prerequisite to transformation. Truth is a prerequisite to transformation. Matthew 24, verse 10, Jesus talking about the last days. Then many will be offended. Check. Come quickly, we're ready. Many will become offended, will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So here he talks about how the love of many will grow cold, but those who endure in love, those who endure in love shall be saved. When Paul is defining love in 1 Corinthians 13, and he's going through the attributes of patient, kind, doesn't seek its own, believes all, what? Endures all. And part of spirit-filled thinking is an enduring love. It means that I don't allow what happens to me to determine what happens in me. 
Like my love, you, like, you can do whatever you want to me, but you can't make me stop loving you. Like what would happen to this world? What would happen in your world if we took on that posture? And we didn't look at relationships as an exchange of I give you this to get that from you. But I say, I love you. And it doesn't matter what you do to me, I'm not turning my love off. My love for you is going to endure. And my love is gonna be patient. My love is gonna be kind. It may not always feel nice. Nice means to be agreeable to the plans of man. It actually comes from a French word meaning stupid. Kind means to set an order as a man arranging furniture in a house. And what we've done is we've tried to pervert kind to make it nice. And we've actually neutered love in the process. But spirit-filled thinking will always reproduce the life of the Lord and others. Amen? So first love follow through in our thought life is what spiritual, spirit-filled thinking is all about. Some key Bible verses we've talked about. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So really what we think about most, we become. What you think determines oftentimes where you end up in life. What you think about is typically where you're headed. How many of you know that? Jeremiah 29, 11 in the NIV, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. The new King James there says, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So again, if we are thinking God thoughts, then we are thinking thoughts of peace and not of evil. Praise God. We're not thinking thoughts about our past. We're not even locked into our present. We're thinking about the future filled with God's favor. But how many know oftentimes people can be imprisoned in their present with worry and they're just trying to get through today so they can get into tomorrow. But when you begin to think like God, you'll be so filled with hope that that all of a sudden the problems of this world are like rain off a duck's back. They get on you, but they can't get in you. Amen? And what gets on you, what comes at you should never have a voice in you. And so one of the things you say, well, how do you do this? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so if what you're hearing and what you're thinking does not produce faith, it's not God. Amen? We say, well, how do I know if, if, if I should be thinking this or if I should be thinking that? Well, let me ask you, is, is it a thought that, that, that causes you to prosper? Is it, is, it a, is, it a, is it a thought that gets you really excited about your future? Is it a thought that fills your heart with hope? If the answer is yes, those are good thoughts to think. In fact, they're God thoughts to think. If your answer is no, then those are thoughts you need to take captive. Amen? Ephesians 3.20 says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And so one of the things we see about spirit-filled thinking is spirit-filled thinking really should lead to spirit-filled praying, that we're praying the will of God according to the word of God. Jesus said in John, he said that, that we have this confidence, or just, uh, John the Beloved said in, in, in 1 John, that we have this confidence in chapter five that if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have what we ask, Amen. And so one of the things we recognize when we begin to think like God and begin to pray like God, we actually begin to partner ourselves with what God desires to do in the earth. Romans 8, 27 says that we can actually have the mind of the spirit and the mind of the spirit is what reveals the ways that God is working together everything in your life for your good. So the mind of the spirit, the Holy Spirit is always thinking about how to make what's happening in your life redemptive, to bring God's goodness for God's glory. One of the things that we also recognize here in Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think is that thoughts often become things. What you think about will tend to manifest in your life. How many of you know that? And the more you think about it, the more you'll attract it. Job said it like this, the thing I fear the most has come upon me. And here's what's interesting is oftentimes there are gonna be self-fulfilling prophecies because someone, if they have a thought, they have a belief or they have an expectation, they will subconsciously live to make that thing a reality. 
It's kind of like your emotional home. It's like, it's the place where you kind of always go to. You, y'all remember Chicken Little? Like, not that you knew him personally, but we've all heard the story. <laughs> oh yeah, went to high school, you know, go with Chicken Little. Chicken Little was the one who always said the sky was falling, right? Well, to somebody else, the heavens were open. And see, what happens is there can be a pessimistic prophetic outlook that is oftentimes connected to hindsight revelation. Well, the Lord had told me this wasn't gonna work. Have you ever heard somebody like that? Devil. You can just say, I, you know, shut up in the name of Jesus. I don't need any after the fact prophetic voices. Because you only, let me tell you what God is up to. God is up to turning bad things together for good. Turning them around. What, what the enemy meant to harm you, God is gonna use to help you. Amen? But here's the thing about situations. And this is, the, this is where spirit-filled thinking is put to the test. You see, like, for instance, when Moses sends the 12 spies to spy out the land of promise, 10 come back talking about giants. The other two come back talking about God. Spirit-filled thinking will always put the focus on God. It'll always magnify what God is doing or about to do in the midst of what's being done. Carnal thinking will always magnify what the devil's doing. Carnal thinking will always manif- will try to magnify the opposition. A spirit-filled thought will always magnify the opportunity. And here's the thing that you see with those 10 spies. They said, we are grasshoppers in our sight. Verse 33 of Numbers chapter 13. We we're grasshoppers in our sight and so we were in theirs. And the thing about spirit-filled thinking and a reality that comes from the inside out is you'll always what you perceive about your situation or yourself, you will project and what you project, you will then attract. This is why misery loves company. And here's the thing is, fear and faith both have a frequency. Some things to to, to, to even ask ourselves to see where we are in terms of what signal we're putting off what we're putting out, because what we're putting out is what we're bringing back, is do people, do people feel at home airing grievances to me about others? In other words, if someone has an offense, do they run to me or do they recognize that offense is gonna be challenged in my presence? Because I'm gonna stay in love and I'm gonna point them to truth. In the same way that your gift will make room for you before great men, and one of the ways you recognize what your gift is because you recognize what people come to you for, you also have to recognize that what is working against your gift, people will come to you for as well. Because oftentimes the enemy can put people in your life to try to hold back who you're called to be. And a carnal thinking puts their needs ahead of his wants, what he desires in the earth. So what we think about, we tend to bring about. Where we go in thought, we typically end up in life. And this is why it's so important to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. What's interesting, is, even as I've been kind of in this journey, even since I had that encounter in April, is as I recognize some judgments that I had had in my heart toward other people, whether it was emotions or feelings like that, and like, I don't need feelings, I've got faith, hallelujah. Man of the word. I don't feel. And guess what? There's a lot of stuff being felt that I just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't acknowledging. And when I started to bring those before the Lord, the Lord actually started showing me that honestly, these are really great indicators. And that in some ways they were actually navigation tools to help me to navigate my heart to be the full expression of who I'm called to be. And I think the church overall has not done a great job. We can do better. I'm sure in certain places they've done a great job, but has not done a great job in equipping and empowering people to to work within the understanding of their feelings and their emotions because we just made them a bad thing. Has anybody ever been a part of that? Certain camps or denominations especially, it's like, oh, no, 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 we just speak the word. We just speak the word, right? Right? Yes, you speak the word, but at the same time, we are a triune being. Amen? And bless God, if I'm speaking the word, I hope to have joy and peace and not just be pissed. There's a lot of people who speak the word, they're just angry. Blessed and highly favored. Well, your face don't know it. 
You ever said, how you doing, blessed and highly favored? <laughs> I'm like, dang, when? 70s? You sour. So real belief produces behavior, but real faith should also produce God feelings. Joy, peace, love. Come on. That our heart overflows because our mind is thinking good thoughts, thoughts that would prosper and give us a future and a hope. So our feelings when redeemed can actually be a great indicator of the thoughts that you're thinking. For instance, when you're thinking on good thoughts, you'll feel good. A merry heart does good like a medicine. When you're thinking God thoughts, you'll begin to have God emotions. You can't think bad thoughts and do well or be in health mentally, spiritually, financially. If you're always thinking, uh, if, you're, if you're always looking to find fault, how many, how many of you know you don't have to look far? Yeah. Amen. All, all the married women say hallelujah. <laughs> but we're, we're not called to find fault. Amen. And whatever you focus on, you will magnify. And one of the things that, you know, I even sent a word of encouragement even to our staff this week too, even as we were kind of, we're looking at even where some things are for Kingsway College and, and, and enrollment and just kind of recognizing where things are right now with current applications based on where they've been in years past and recognizing, wow, things are going a little slower this year in terms of having new student applications come in. I'm like, well, bless God, I think the whole church has gone through it. And, you know, I'm like, you know, there's, there needs to be our, our, the voice and the invitation needs to get out to a bigger audience. But I started praying about it and I'm like, So are we supposed to do more? Are we supposed to promote more? I mean, because we get all the invitations to, hey, do this, do that, da, da, da. And when it feels like striving, like we're gonna have to do something to make something happen, I know we're just gonna have to keep doing more to make more happen. And I really believe that there's something in God that just like he did for Peter when he brought the fish to him, that if we can remain present with the Lord and remain thankful for what he's doing in our life, he'll begin to attract to us, the ones that we're called to empower and equip. And so I sent just a, a video message to the staff. I said, guys, listen, I was praying this morning and I really feel like God wants to do something different and something new, even for the college this year. And one of the things, instead of trying to figure out how we can reach more people in more places, and honestly, those are good things. It's good to reach more people in more places, but not out of pressure. I said, I really feel like there's something about just beginning to open our heart and the spirit and say, God, we wanna receive right now the students that you have called to be a part of Kingsway College. And Lord, we thank you now for those students who may have never heard the name Kingsway. They don't know who any of us are, but God, I thank you, Lord, that you're bringing those fish into this boat because we have something of value. And so instead of looking at what we needed, I began to start giving thanks for what we've got. The absolute best program on the planet. I mean, from the, the, caliber of quali- the caliber and quality of content to the instructors, to the dynamic of worship and the word, no other place on the planet is doing what we're doing here right now. And as I began to start just giving thanks for what we do have, I began to recognize that God can do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. And spirit-filled thinking will always put the focus on what you do have, not what you need. Carnal thinking will always look at what you need and cause you to deny what you've got. And what happens in that place, we can become unthankful. And you'll never have more of what you want until you're thankful for what you have. In fact, you can say like this, what you think about and think about, you bring about. It's one thing to think about it, but sometimes people can think about it, and it's not necessarily good thoughts. But when you begin to think about it in your heart, recognizing this is what what future looks like for me in God, according to his word, according to what he has promised me, according to my understanding of his goodness in my life in this season, this is what I begin to see. This is what the sound of the abundance of rain looks like in my life. And I don't just think about it. I begin to thank God for the cloud. I begin to thank it. It may only be the size of a man's hand, but it's there. What you think about and you begin to think about, you'll bring about. Why is this important? Because there are realities in the earth the Holy Spirit is desiring to birth. And eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God is about to do. But 
but he reveals them to us by the Holy Spirit. And the way we can begin to think like God and give thanks for what God desires to do to where it really is God who does it for us and not us doing it for God is by giving our thought life to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to bring correction along with direction. Allow him to bring a turning when need be. So again, spirit, the fruit of spirit-filled thinking, the, our fruit is oftentimes what people taste and see in the public parts of our life. In other words, what people experience with you is oftentimes the evidence of what's happening in you. If people, if, if you come into a room, everybody gets excited, that's a good sign. If you come into a room and all of a sudden you're the only one left in the room, that's not a good sign. <laughs> all, all of a sudden, everybody's got to go. <laughs> like, oh, everybody's got to meet. Okay, we're, we're, we're. <laughs> and, it's, it, it, and it's like, we, there's an awareness we need to have of how people feel us and see us. And I think that some of that awareness can only happen when you're willing to slow down. Amen. I remember asking our staff one time and I just said, hey, you know, just anonymously, let me know. So I think, let, let me know. When you see my name come up on your caller ID, what emotion come, like what, what feeling do you have? When you see a text from me, what, is it, man, he really loves me or man, he really needs me to do this? Is it something that draws you in or is it something that pushes you out? I wanna know those things. And understanding how we're received by others helps us to steward our portion in a way to where we don't just walk with the believers, but also the unbelievers. There was a reason why, why, why prostitutes and tax collectors love to hang out with Jesus, even though Jesus was staunchly against robbing, robbery, usury, and prostitution. And what has happened was in a desire to be like Jesus, we've tried to become okay with what they do, thinking then they will want to be with us. That's not spirit-filled thinking. That's a way that seems right, that is so wrong. And in that way, the church has watered down the power of the gospel. It's time for spirit-filled thinking. So our fruit is what people taste and see in the public parts of our life. And as much emphasis as we put on the fruit, this week as I've really been praying about what to talk about today, I really felt like that we weren't supposed to talk about the fruit as much as the root. Because apart from a root, there is no fruit. And so if, if the fruit of the Holy Spirit or fruit of spirit-filled thinking is what people experience in our life, what they taste and see in the public parts of who we are, our root is what we practice in private as an offering of our hearts. Oftentimes between us and the Lord, it's that hard work that is heart work. And that's where real transformation happens. And it, you know, it, without private devotion and without discipline, there will never be a significant public demonstration. And so I began to start looking at the importance of roots in the scriptures. And let me just share a few with you and then we'll look at John 15 and, and then we'll look at what this means to us today. That clock just keeps on moving, hallelujah. So Proverbs chapter 12, verse three and Proverbs chapter 12, verse 12 gives two explanations or two um, definitions of the root of the righteous. Verse three says the root of the righteous cannot be moved. It's immovable. So the root of the righteous holds the line, hallelujah. So now what is that? Is it self-righteousness? No. He who knew no sin became sin for us that I could become the righteous of God in Christ. So when I know who I am, I don't waver through the fear of man or the fear of loss. So the root of the righteous will not be moved. Why? Because you can't do anything to me. How many times do people make a decision out of the fear of what someone else could do? That is an unrighteous root and it'll produce unrighteous fruit. Verse 12 says, the root of the righteous yields fruit. Paul stressed the importance of being rooted in Colossians chapter two, verses six through eight. He says, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Then he told us being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So he's telling us that part of how we are rooted is, is by walking in the word that we have been taught and then abounding with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is like miracle growth for the seeds of God in your life. Then he goes on to say, and this is the warning, 
This is where I think some people are in this season. So he's saying, listen, this is what spirit-filled thinking looks like. You're rooted, you're established, you know, you're walking in the word and you're abounding with thanksgiving. That is evidence of spirit-filled thinking. That is a joyful, peaceful, loving heart that is living a life of abundant overflow. But then he gives a warning in verse eight, beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, not according to Christ. And this is where we see a present evil in our day that is not new. This was actually around in Jesus' day and the enemy has been attempting to do it since then. And it's called deconstruction. How many of you have heard of deconstruction? Okay. So an an example of uh, deconstruction in Jesus' life was like in Mark chapter Two, when he's there to heal the paralytic. And, 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 uh, but he says to the, to the scribes and the religious guys, he goes, hey, why are you reasoning in your hearts? In other words, why are you trying to talk yourself into unbelief? Because deconstruction is what happens when we attempt to understand a supernatural gospel with a carnal mind. It is when people begin to try to shape the gospel to fit them instead of them being transformed by the gospel. It ultimately leads to picking and choosing what parts of this word you believe are applicable to you to over time weaken your faith because it it begins to weaken your relationship with the person who is truth. If, 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 If you had a relationship, whether it's a spouse or a friend, you said, I like this about you, but I don't like that. How many know that relationship is gonna begin to suffer? Jesus is not Piccadilly. You don't pick this and leave that. You got to eat the whole lamb. And what is happening is people are trying to exalt their situation over his scriptures. It's the exaltation of their personal facts over his eternal truth. So what do we do about it? We continue to speak truth and love. And I want to tell you, you can help more people by pointing to the answer than by pointing to the problem. I don't think telling someone they're wrong has ever made them want to be right. But when we choose to be righteous, they want to be like him. The root of the righteous will, be, will, will not be moved. It holds a line. And see, consistency always answers your critics. Because the truth is, there's a lot of inconsistency in the world around us. Because if what's happening in the world determines what's happening in you, you are not rooted. The parable of the sower actually talks about this in Mark chapter four, verses 16 through 17. He says, these likewise are the ones sown on the stony ground who when they hear the word, immediately they receive with gladness. Like, ooh, praise God, hallelujah. And they have no root in themselves, so they endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. And see, the thing about it is the word is sown in us, but the room that we give that word in us is where it then gets root. God is faithful to sow the word. Amen. How many of you are thankful for the word of God sown in your heart? But the place that you give to his word in your life will determine the root it has in you and ultimately the fruit that is expressed through you. Paul also said in Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith that we be rooted and grounded in love. So roots do need a place to grow. The word is sown, but we then have to give place to the word for that word to grow in us. So a good place to be planted is Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, think about, feast on these things. Is it true? You can eat it. Is it noble? Is it full of virtue? Does it add to you? You can have it. Is it lovely? Is it worth looking at? Then you're able to give it your attention or is it gonna lead you astray? Is it a good report? or a bad report. The 10 spies brought back a bad report. It cost an entire nation their season of inheritance. 
to where they had to wait a whole another 40 years for a new generation to be birthed. The great thing is, is you can live in a compromising generation and not embrace compromise. Like Joshua and Caleb. And I believe there's Joshua's and Caleb's that are in our midst and rising up among us. Turn to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Because we prosper in our planting when we remain planted. Again, we're talking about the root for spirit-filled thinking. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the word. And in his law, he meditates, he talks to himself day and night. So this is talking about what he does. Now let's look at who he is. Who he is because of what he's done, what he's given his mind to, his focus to, the way that he's guarded his heart with diligence. Verse three, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does will prosper. And this is what the life of the believer is always meant to look like. That whatever we do, we prosper. Whatever we do, it works. I remember there was um, people, even um, this, I remember I'm thinking of, you know, just one person in particular who was a pastor. And he, you know, he had, um, and we, 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 we love each other. We helped each other, stuff like that. Like, you know, there's a lot of things we did for him over the years, but he just got honest with me one time. He said, you know, man, it just makes me angry. I said, what? He said, everything you do works. He said, you know, we could talk about doing something for 15 years. You just come in, decide you're going to do it. And all of a sudden it works. I'm like, well, why does that make you mad? I'm just doing what you had the idea to do. I just happened to do it. He said, man, we, we talked about it for 15 years. And whenever we would talk about it, someone have a reason why not to do it. I said, that's the problem. You're talking to me, people. I don't ask for consensus when God speaks. Thank you. I don't ask for a vote. If you're trying to keep everybody happy, you're never going to create a habitation. God is always looking for one man and one, or one woman who is just willing to do whatever it takes. When God says jump, they say how high on the way up. They're not saying, hey, did you hear that too? I just want to make sure I don't get into error. So make sure I don't believe too big. Amen. Because if it's a thought to prosper, future and hope, I bet it's God. You know who's not trying to make me think about my future? The devil. He's always trying to make me think of my past. You know who's not trying to make me think thoughts of hope? The devil. He's always trying to get me hopeless. He's trying to get me to think about poverty, not prosperity. He's not wanting peace, he's wanting evil. He's wanting me to partner with what could go wrong, that chicken little spirit, instead of blaming, well, bless God, I wonder what God could do. What if we really went all in on God? Like if we really trusted him and sought him with our whole heart. Jeremiah 29, 12 says you'd find him. He says, when you seek for me with your whole heart, you will find me. And worry divides our heart into pieces. So here again, we see that trees that are planted will prosper. Their leaf will not wither, which is the life they have to give to others. I mean, it says the leaves of the tree in Revelation 22 were for the healing of the nations. But the thing is, is the tree can't produce fruit what it does will not prosper and its leaf will surely wither if it does not remain planted. And what has been at work in the world against the body of Christ being renewed in the spirit of their mind has been a fence and an attempt to uproot us from where we're called to be and who we're called to walk with. Jesus never promised that things would be easy. In fact, he said, be of good cheer. It's gonna be hard. He said, he, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but don't worry, I've overcome and you're with me. Amen? And right now there's entire churches and movements that what's been happening in the world around them is so different than the gospel that they were taught. They're having a crisis of faith because they're like, wait a minute, this, I, I didn't even know that this could happen. Like, like, where is God in this? And they start having conversations. Well, I don't think that God would do that. Well, that's the problem. You don't think like God. Are you with me? Because we've not eaten the full lamb. The kindness and the severity. And what that does is it keeps you on the path of the righteous. And that's where we're called to walk. There's a ditch on either side. 
Rick Joyner taught me this years ago, lawlessness and legalism. Amen? And see, grace without truth will lead to lawlessness. Truth without grace will lead to legalism. But Jesus stands in the middle of the road with grace and truth in his hands, inviting us to come and walk with him. So what does that look like? Let's look at John 15 and then we'll close. That was all just the opener, by the way. That was just a point one. John 15 is where I wanted to get to. We may just have to take a few weeks here. But he said, I am the vine. This is Jesus. I am the vine. In other words, I am the source of your thought life. My word is the seed. And when it gets a root in you, I begin to grow in you. He is the vine that is growing up from the root. And he is the one that produces the fruit. And what's, what's so beautiful here is we don't have to make fruit happen. We just have to be willing to allow his word in us to go deep enough to make room for what he's doing and what he's saying, what he desires to where he can be more like him. And we begin to make room for his word in our life. It allows us to get rooted. And then when we get rooted, we don't have to do the growing. We just, do this, we, we just stay planted. And he begins to grow through us. I am the vine. My father is the vine, grand, vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I want you to think about branches as thoughts. Every thought that does not pr produce the fruit of faith, truth wants to prune away. Every thought that tries to attach itself to us it doesn't come from him, but how many know there's thoughts that'll try to attach? Every thought that tries to attach itself to me that is pointed to my past, truth comes and cuts that away. So that the branches in me, the thoughts that he thinks about me can become more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is, because he, he speaks to him, he says, every branch that doesn't bear fruit gets taken away, thrown in the fire. Every branch that does is gonna get pruned. So he's like, all right, if you're doing good, you're gonna get cut. And if you're, if you're not doing good, you're gonna go away. But then he gives him a word of encouragement. He said, you're already clean because of the word. In other words, the slate's already clean. There's nothing held against you. And I love that Jesus said that because I could feel even when they said that statement of every branch being thrown into the fire or being pruned, that all of a sudden they could very, it was an invitation, but they could have condemnation. Because invitation and condemnation is often not determined by the person who gives it. It's always through the heart of the one who receives it. You can give the same opportunity to two different people. One can feel condemned, the other feel, can feel invited because of how they see themselves. If they don't see themselves as worthy, they could see themselves condemned. But if they think the thoughts about them that God thinks toward them, they're gonna be like, oh, bless God, it's an invitation for an upgrade. Blessing, favor, and increase. I'm stepping into my purpose. I'm stepping into my destiny. Verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So he's saying, hey, you wanna know how to bear fruit? Stay with me. Abide in me. John 8, he says, abide in the word. You see, the word is we, where, where we are planted. This word is where we stay. And this word is God's gift to us to transform our lives, that we be renewed in the spirit of our mind as we apply this word to our heart, but also to our head. We begin to bring the thoughts that we think outside of our devotional time back to the truth that we encountered during that time of devotion. Say, okay, when I bring this back before Jesus, is that a thought he thinks about me? Or is that coming from another tree? He goes on to say, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. 
for without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Go ahead and stand to your feet. See, when we begin to, to think like God thinks, we begin to have the authority in that situation that God has. Prayers of faith can't be prayed from hearts of fear. And I think that a lot of times what we can offer to God as intercession can be the reflection of fear. It can be the pushing back in the places we're pressed instead of saying, I'm rooted. I'm grounded in this love. I'm established in the faith and I'm gonna abound with thanksgiving. His thoughts have become my thoughts and his ways have become my ways. And according to those, I will pray. And so one of the areas even this week I was asking the Lord for me is, God, I'm so thankful for the fruit that I'm seeing in my life. And honestly, I'm even publicly, I'm, I'm kind of restrained in terms of how much I'm allowing myself to even talk about publicly right now because I don't want to share something prematurely. I think a lot of times, especially in the prophetic camp, we can say something too soon. We see a principle with Elizabeth she got pregnant and she, she didn't show anybody or tell anybody for five months because she allowed what God gave her to grow in her. Because she was surrounded by naysayers. Even her husband. I mean, heaven put a gag order on Zachariah. <laughs> because words can abort your promise. And so I made it very important to not just talk to you about these things, but to live my life walking in them on a level that is deeper than I've ever known. And I know that in many ways, this is preparing us as a house, preparing us as a family for what God has always desired for us. But honestly, if we were to receive without that heart work, it could hurt and not help. People would come all over, you know, be like, I can't believe you guys are in a church of 1,500 or 3,000, da, 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 you know, and, and honestly, I'm like, listen, a premature blessing be a burden. I don't want anything for us that we're not called to carry. Jesus said in John 16, 12, there's so many things I want to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And I believe that a lot of what the Lord is inviting his body into in this season is the internal fortitude of faith the place of our planting where it can be rooted and established that no matter what he wants us to carry, we would not lose a step, that our knee would not bend and we would be able to maintain his standard to the end. And so what I've been praying is God, I, I love the fruit that I'm seeing. And I love how it's transforming every area of my life <laughs> and uh, having a dramatic impact on the people who are closest to me. But Lord, I'm not content. I'm not, I'm not satisfied. I'm not gonna say, okay, whoo, man, can let off the gas. I'm thankful, but I wanna go deeper. Because in a small window of time, it's like he's pulled back a curtain and he's shown me what's available to us all. And it has so captured my heart. And it's so helped my focus. I'm like, Lord, I will give the rest of my life to growing deeper and being present with who you are in this boat. Recognizing the times where I could do great things for God, but at the same time, 
he could do greater things for me if I remained at rest in him. And I think that one of the areas where a lot of times in the church, and we've seen this with certain other ministries now, where there can be either burnout or there can be um, stuff happening that should not happen is when people start off with great intentions. We talked about a situation earlier where, again, I believe it was great intentions, but cracks in the foundation. And when the enemy tries to get in, he finds a place to put a hook and he waits till a place to where that person is just high enough that when he pulls that hook, it can take out a lot of people with it. Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he's got nothing in me. And I want that to be said of all of us. That he doesn't have a place in us he can touch. That there's not something he can do that would cause a trigger of the old man to spring up. Because the weapons of our warfare really are not carnal. But they're supernatural. They're spirit-filled. And I want to pray for all of us this morning that whatever room in our life God is wanting to expand our root system for us to be able to give him that room to go deeper in us. I remember for years, kind of our, our, our thing as a church was that we made more room for more people to experience more of God, and we did. But I really feel like that now, it's not about more people experiencing God. I feel like that God's wanting to do more in us. And people will come to that because they're gonna come to Jesus. And so if you're saying, I want my roots to go deeper so that I can produce fruit that remains, I just want you to raise both hands to the Lord and I wanna pray. Paul said, what I have, I give. John and Peter, when they were the man at the gate, beautiful, they said, we don't have gold, we don't have silver, but what we do have, we give you. Paul said, I want to come to you that I can impart you a gift and a grace to be established. And Holy Spirit, I recognize that we are stewards of your grace and of your gift, but you are doing something in us. I know you're doing something in me and I know you're doing something in my family. I know you're doing something in the heart and the home of every person in this house. And we just come to you, Holy Spirit, and say we trust you with more of us, more room in our life, more of the private places, Lord, that you want to go deeper. Lord, that there be a dramatic increase of devotion and even discipline. But it would not be the discipline that is applied to self to prove or perform, but it'd be simple discipline based on devotion. Choices we make because of our love for you. God, I ask, Lord, for the soil of our situation, Lord, where, where maybe it's been hard or it's been stony, God. Lord, where the cares of this world have tried to come and to pluck up your word in times past. For you to come in and begin to turn over that soil. That you break up the hard places by speaking a tender word. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that in this summer of giving ourselves to the renewing of our mind, Lord, that you would not leave any stone unturned in us. That we would not be allowed to hold on to anything that would hold us back from that upward call of Christ Jesus. And so we say today like Paul, we're not where we're going, but praise God, we're not where we were. And we are letting go of things that are behind us. We are forgetting those things which are behind so we can reach fully forward with both arms and grab a hold of our future. And I want you to see yourself doing that. I want, to, I want you just, even with your imagination right now, to see you letting go of every limitation of your past for some of you, it's been labels that, that you knew as a child. For some, it may even be something that was connected with how you were brought up or the family that you came from. For some, it may be a past mistake or a sin or something that would somehow disqualify you or discredit you. I stand before you as someone who, who should be completely disqualified and discredited, but the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. And there's nothing in your past that can keep you from his power in the present to allow you to grab your future with both hands. And so I just want you, to, I want, I want you to see yourself letting go of everything in the past that has held you back and then reach your arms forward and grab a hold of that future 
filled with God's favor. Grab a hold of that in abundance. Grab a hold of that increase. Grab a hold of that hope. I don't want you to hold on to it until it becomes a part of you. Because God is with you, mighty man of valor. God is with you, daughter of destiny. And this is your time of favor. Holy Spirit, I do, I thank you for continuing to allow every thought to become more like what you think about us. And Lord, when we do have a thought that doesn't line up with you, that we're quick to catch it, not get condemned, but cast it aside. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I bless you. Have an incredible week. God is with you. We're so glad you're able to join us online for this service at Kingsway. We pray you are blessed, encouraged, and empowered through this broadcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date with our latest content. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can like, comment on what impacted you, and even share with your friends. No matter which platform you're using, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at testimony at kingswayal.com. We are so excited to hear what God is doing in you. We really are, and we're grateful for all the things that are happening in and through the family of Kingsway. We want you to know we love you, we're praying for you, and we bless you to walk in the fullness of who you're called to be. We'll see you next time.